Goeie dag my christen vriende en welkom terug bij Sola Platform. Jy is so welkom om aan te sluit en te stuur vir predikante, pastore, ouderlinge, lidmate in kerke wat jij weet wat bemoedig kan word, wat uitgedaag kan word om getrouwd te bly aan die Heere Jesus en sy woord in hier die komplekse postmoderne dier mekaar wereld. Vriende, jullie weet ons die twee kanalen nou vir die bediening, ons het die instituut vir reformatie in Zuid-Afrika, wat elke jaar een conferentie doen, wat predikante uitnooi, toerisse, academische boek publiseer, en ons het ook Sola platform, wat vir gewone lidmate uh, gerat is, om jullie die dingen van die theologie te probeer vertaal en te verteer in gewone taal, om jullie te bemoedig, en wat ik gedink het is, ek het gedink om een onderhoud wat ons bij die instituut vir reformatie opgeleid het, wat in Engels is, bykie met jullie te kom deel hier vandag. Ek is so opgewonde oor hierdie onderhoud wat ons gevoer het met Dirk de Waal. Nou hy is geboren in Kaapstad en as babiekie in 1995 is hy in sy ouwers Canada toe waar hy school gegaan het, hy begin ijshockey speel, maar sy ouwers het aan nou Afrikaans met hom praat, so hy praat baie mooi Afrikaans, hy het later ijshockey gespeel, een merkwaardige verhaal, toe hy een roeping gekry om te gaan theologie studeer en hier studeer hy theologie by RTS, Reform Theological Seminary in Amerika. Hy doen navorsing en hy vind uit, ons is in Zuid-Afrika bezig om die reformatorische erfenis te herontdek en hy kontak my, ons word vriende en hy het een hoofstuk in hierdie boek geskrywe. So ek wil jou uitnooi um, om te kom saam luister, dit is in Engels, meeste van dit is in Engels en ek hoop dit gaan vir jou bemoedig en ek wil jou nou wel sê, as dit jou aangryp, wil jy dit nie ook stuur aan vriende en familie nie en ook kommentaar stuur van bemoedigen. Kom ons luister saam. If you don't come to terms with the sovereignty of God as the final explanation for the discouragements of your life, you won't survive. They kept on saying, you know, the glory of God, the glory of God, the glory of God this, the glory of God that. God does everything for his own glory, for his own glory over and over. It was the theme of the day, it seemed like. They were obsessed with that idea. And I just remember thinking, wow, this, this element of the glory of God, it just, it literally was like a light bulb flicked on. And from wow. that day on, that aspect has never been a question for me. That's made total sense. And the beautiful thing is, I later go and I, I'm reading in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, which is one of my favorite verses, which is what part of what John Piper preached on this very evening. I remember listening to Paul Washer in my dorm room, with, just on my phone, and, and uh, the sermon was like 11 minutes long, and it was like all about how Jesus died. He died! The Father gave His Son! When you say things like, Jesus died, shouldn't you stop for a moment or something? I mean, He died. He really died. And it was His blood shed on that tree that's the only reason the black filth of your sin can be washed away. That blood on that tree, the slaughter of the Son of God. And he just like hammered away why Jesus died and the fact that he died for my sin and the fact that the propitiation of Jesus' blood could cover anybody's sin, no matter how bad or how yeah. ridiculous, foolish, young and um, sinful that I was. And so, um, you know, that just, that just struck, stuck with me, always has. I was born in Cape Town, like you said. My parents are Afrikaans, and so in 1995, when I was just one year old, that was when we went to Canada. So I grew up playing ice hockey instead of rugby. And uh, I do know how to speak Afrikaans fluently, although Jy praat, jy praat goed Afrikaans. Ja, ek praat goed Afrikaans, maar dit is net... Uh, as ek Engels praat, klink ek soos een Canadees. As ek Afrikaans praat, weet ek nie wat ek, hoe ek klink hier. Een kapenaar. Een kapenaar seker, maar ook uh, ou met ek baie klein woorde skat, want ek meestal Engels gepraat. Maar, dit klink goed, man. In elk geval, uh, sien ek hak al klaar vast. It's not <laughs> as conducive to a very nice interview. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> My... Uh, my desire or my ambition was always to go and play first junior hockey and then Division one hockey in the United States and then hopefully to make it to the professional the highest professional ranks uh, they 
kind of signed, kind of temporarily got me on board to be able to play that weekend in an exhibition game. And I played the first game, and it was an amazing, like great experience. Uh, immediately, like had an impact and was enjoying it. And I was like, I felt like I was like, oh, this is this might be the place for me. Mm. And the next day, my knee got kneed. I cut into the middle of the ice, and a guy came across and hit me knee on knee, and tore my MCL. And so not only was I now cut from my yeah. team that I was trying to go to make it, now I also couldn't even play on this yeah. team. So I was three to four months out. That's a, and that's a serious injury. Yeah, serious injury. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was thankfully not like an ACL or something that needed surgery, but it was something that completely messed up the stability of my knee. Like, And then later on that year, um, my friends, a couple of my buddies, Sven, Eric, and then also Nick, mm. these were older guys and they were all reformed, all Calvinistic Baptists, it's like what I am now. And they all, um, they all invited me out uh, to go for coffee with them and drive around and, and I was sitting in the back and since I was so new to this, I didn't have much to say. I just kind of sat there and listened. And they kept on saying, you know, the glory of God, the glory of God, the glory of God this, the glory of God that. Friends, welcome uh, to the Institute for Reformation in South Africa. Um, I have the great joy of having a conversation with Pastor Pastor Dirk de Waal, who um, was born in Cape Town and as a baby, uh, his parents went to Canada uh, and then uh, there he uh, became English Canadian. Uh, eventually he got to know the Lord, went mm. to RTS where he just finished his MDiv recently. Mm. And the, it's a remarkable story for me of how a South African baby went to, went to Canada uh, and is returning to Cape Town, Lord willing, later in the year mm -hmm. to do some work with us at the Institute for Reformation in South Africa. So mm. uh, we want to um, thank you, brother, for the... Uh, opportunity to talk. We are here in yes. um, North Carolina at yeah. Charlotte, uh, mm -hmm. attending a conference of Kevin de Young and mm -hmm. uh, Carl Truman and Piper and so on. A wonderful yes. um, a privilege for us to be here. So let's let's start at the beginning. You were born in South Africa and you grew up in Canada. Just mm -hmm. unpack that for us in a few minutes. Yeah, first of all, I want to say it is a big privilege to be here and to do this interview with you, Ferdi. Um, I will also correct you briefly and say that I am not yet a pastor. I need to become a pastor still, but I'm on my way, Lord willing. I uh, look forward to, uh, I look forward to, yeah, we're, our plan is to, like, as you said, to go to South Africa this year, if everything goes according to plan and if the yeah. Lord opens the doors as he's already done. Right. Um, we look forward to church planting, hopefully, and being involved with Ursa. Do you, do you say Ersa still in English or do you want to keep it to... However you want to say it. Yeah, all right. So, um, yeah, um, where does it begin? So, to begin with, it starts in my, my home. Uh, I was born in Cape Town, like you said, but uh, my parents are Afrikaans. And so in 1995, when I was just one year old, that was when we went to Canada. So I grew up playing ice hockey instead of rugby. And uh, I do know how to speak Afrikaans fluently, although it's praat, a lot... Jy praat goed Afrikaans. Ja, ek praat goed Afrikaans, maar dit is net... Uh, sien ek ook al klaar was. It's not <laughs> as conducive to a very nice interview. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Want ek haak heel tyd vast in my woorde skat, maar ja. Did you watch the Springbok rugby while you were yes. doing hockey? Yes, yes, of course, yeah. Okay. I love watching rugby. Uh, I never stuff. played a single game of rugby in my life, but... And Biltong and uh, Druevors? Yeah, um, Druevors and Biltong, yeah, we, I obviously love that. My, my dad and my brother started hunting when I was quite young and they'd always make Biltong and Druevors with everything, so super Great. accessible for us. But a lot of other good South African treats were too far away, so yeah. Okay. And then, um, yeah, I grew up in a Christian home uh, where the gospel was explained or proclaimed to me and told that I need to believe it but and also went to a church that I believe does preach the gospel um, most of the time in my youth but I didn't it didn't resonate with me it didn't break me and and cut me to my core and change my life until I was about 18 or 19 okay. and okay yeah. just say you you started to play hockey yes yeah. and then something happened yeah so my 
my desire or my ambition was always to go and play first junior hockey and then Division One hockey in the United States and then hopefully to make it to the professional, the highest professional ranks. Um, and then when I was in my second year of junior hockey, something very unexpected happened, which was that I got cut from the team. So, uh, yeah, it was a huge shock to me and it was a big... Um, Disappointment. Yeah, big disappointment yeah. for me. Very, very disappointing to just have this moment where um, my goals sort of came to an end there. And so then... Um, I'm a failure kind of thing. Yeah, kind of that aspect. And then something really interesting happened. This is part of why I'm so strong, strongly certain of the sovereignty of God and salvation and stuff like that. Because something interesting happened to me then. I was driving home. So the place I played junior hockey was eight hours east of where uh, I lived in Lethbridge, Alberta. And one of my buddies from high school the year prior, which I only found this out years later, the year prior had won a lottery, which allowed him to go to this college, which was situated between those two cities. He won a, a lottery at a youth conference that was basically like a year free tuition or something like that. Wow. He never, he told me explicitly, I never would have gone there was it not for this lottery of like thousands of youth. So he goes there. And I'm all depressed leaving where I was playing hockey because mm. I just got cut. I feel like a big loser. Mm. Don't have a team to play for. Mm. And I called up uh, my buddy Tyron Van Ham, or Fun Hum, I guess, as you would say in the Dutch. Um, and, I, and I said, hey, I'm driving through because I knew he was there. I didn't know why he was there at the time, but I knew he was there. So I stopped in to say hi. And when I did, he said, well, Dirk, you know that there's a, you know that there's a hockey team here? And I was like, well... No, actually, I was very shocked by that. And I even remember when I was in high school, this same college would come and advertise at our Christian high school with a little booth and stuff like that. And mm. I remember thinking, there's no way I'm ever going to go there. Mm. I remember explicitly being like, this is not for me. I'm better than this or something. Oh, yeah. Okay. That kind of mentality, yeah, yeah, yeah. like, this is not, like, I'm not even going to talk to these guys because I'm <laughs> not going to go there ever. <laughs> But then my buddy tells me, no, go check and see if the hockey coaches are over there. They just finished practice. And I went and walked in the room and talked to them. And at first they were like, well, who's this guy? What's he doing here? Mm. Eventually it became clear who I was. And they were like, well, now we're interested in maybe having you play on the team. So one of the coaches said, are you practicing with us tomorrow? Right? And I'm like, what? I practicing with you tomorrow, so I'm like, oh, I don't know. Like, you want me to practice with you tomorrow? Okay. Well, your kit is in the back My of the car. My kit's in the back. Everything I own is in the back of the car. <laughs> so that's convenient. But anyways, they got me a little room in the dorm there. Wow. I practiced the next day. Ended up being that like they really wanted me to stay. Um, and I was in kind of a limbo. I, I was hoping to get picked up by another junior team. Mm. Um, but then that next weekend, so it was a, it was a great experience right off the bat for the first time in my life playing with Christians had a big impact on me. Mm. Spending, just being in a team of Christian people, I was like, what, there's such a difference here, evident mm. in the way that things go, the way that the talk, the talk goes, the way the encouragement goes, everything in the locker room was yeah. different. Can I just say, I remember, um, we've yeah. been friends now for just yeah. over two years, and I remember vividly, I was in uh, Romsey, it's just outside of Southampton, in a mm. park when we spoke about this, about those, friends that you met and there was mm. something different about them yes yeah explain that i'll unpack that a little bit a little bit more what was yeah. different about their christianity yeah well it was maybe i didn't have eyes to see it before but it's especially a bunch of brothers mm. in a camaraderie on a team but also just the, the stark contrast between my junior and my minor hockey teams compared to that team where there was sure. i'd say at least 50 or 60 percent of the guys were solid Christian guys, like yeah. really solid, wanting to be holy, living their life. So the vibe and the and it, like just the experience of it was different. I know that's mm -hmm. weird to talk about the vibe, but if you want, it just there wasn't all the crassness and rudeness and um, breaking each other down. There's, I immediately noticed that within like a couple of days. Yes. So that was immediately something that stuck out to me. But yes. then that weekend, uh, they kind of signed, kind of temporarily got me on board to be able to play that weekend in an exhibition game. And I played the first game and it was amazing, like great experience, uh, immediately like had an impact and was enjoying it. And I was like, I felt like I was like, oh, this is, this might be the place for me. Mm. And the next day, my knee got kneed. I cut into the middle of the ice and a guy came across and hit me knee on knee and tore my MCL. And so not only was I now cut from 
my yeah. team that I was trying to go to make it. Now I also couldn't even play on this yeah. team. So I was three to four months out. That's a, and that's a serious injury. Yeah, serious injury. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was thankfully not like an ACL or something that needed surgery, but it was something that completely messed up the stability in my knee. Like, yeah. it was just completely weak. And, oh, wow. and so I had to take three to four months off. And so... Went to hospital, they yeah, went everything. home. Yeah, went MRI, home. the whole nine yards. Yeah, so I, was, yeah. I didn't go home. I stayed at the oh, campus. Oh, did you? Yeah, so that's what was impactful, actually, because I was, yeah. yeah, I just had my whole direction for life changed. And yeah. also now I've got this injury, so I can't play hockey, which is where my whole identity is. Yeah. And then on top of that, I'm surrounded by a bunch of Christians, real ones. Mm. So now all of a sudden, all my sin and stuff like that starts to come to light. And okay. I start to realize there's talk, a big talk problem. Talk about that. Talk about that. Yeah, so in that context, just never, I never really spent a lot of time with, I w I've always spent a lot of time with Christians, but I never spent a lot of time with people who, this is kind of a contradiction in terms, but someone who's a Christian who's not seeking holiness isn't a real Christian. But I spent a lot of people, a lot of time with people who had the name Christian. Mm. But this environment was a environment where a lot of people around me were desperately and earnestly seeking holiness and obedience to God and faithfulness to his word and also speaking to me about it constantly. And, I, and you know, when you're in that environment, that's one of the things, if you can just be in the presence of unbelievers, sometimes they can see the difference in your life right away. Yeah. And mm. yeah, like I said, I grew up in a Christian home and everything, but I never experienced this kind of earnest seeking after holiness and this yeah. um, mm. also vulnerability, mm. honesty with each other, yeah. the, the willingness to say, yeah, I struggle with this, I struggle with that. I'm, yeah. That all culminated to me being at a very low point, like mm -hmm. in terms of my own pride and ego, but also coming to the realization that there's some serious sin problems and I need help. I can't, conviction of sin. Yeah, conviction of sin, and I yeah. can't fix this on my own. Romans 3. Exactly, exactly. And I could not do this on my own. Mm -hmm. And so the beauty of that at that point was um, I had a neighbor, and his name was Nick Betzing. Right. And, and he wouldn't mind if I said this. He is a Christian rapper, and when I met him, I thought that was the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Christian rap music. Uh, and he is today, he is today was one of my best men at my wedding, and then the other one was my brother. Mm. So that just goes to show. At first I thought this guy, you couldn't be anything weirder than a Christian rapper. Mm. I ended up talking to him becoming friends with him. And something that stuck out to me was he was a Reformed Baptist guy and he was committed to the Bible. He was committed to the truth. And so he was also very patient with me and would stay up and answer all my questions until one, two in the morning, wow. as much as, he, as needed to be. And so he would stay up and he would talk to me and answer my questions and help me. And eventually I was persuaded that it was correct, this Calvinism, this Reformed doctrine, and uh, also just very motivated to kill sin and, 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 mm. and coming under conviction and repenting of my sin and brokenness over my sin, all at that same season of life. Wow. And then... Um, while you were, you know, you've got a leg in... Uh, yeah. In, in yeah, a, while my leg is healing up and just while my life plans have changed direction completely and while I'm in this environment with a lot of Christians and then yeah. also just, you know... Yeah, it's a time of great uncertainty and difficulty, but also, you know, it just was important how, how this conviction took place in my life. I remember, I think, this was not the main kind of moment where everything clicked for me, but there was a moment where I was listening to Paul Washer in my dorm room. Probably, I stayed up really late at that time. It was my first year of college, and I was mm. always just doing weird things and mm. up to no good. And, and uh, I remember listening to Paul Washer in my dorm room with, just on my phone and and uh, the sermon was like 11 minutes long and it was like all about how Jesus died and he just like hammered away why Jesus died and the fact that he died for my sin and the fact that the propitiation of Jesus' blood could cover anybody's sin no matter how bad or how yeah. ridiculous, foolish, young and um, sinful that I was and so um, you know, that just, that just struck, stuck with me, always has. And then later on that year, um, my friends, a couple of my buddies, Sven, Eric, and then also Nick, mm. these were older guys, and they were all Reformed, all Calvinistic Baptists, which is like what I am now. And they all, um, 
they all invited me out uh, to go for coffee with them and drive around and and I was sitting in the back and since I was so new to this I didn't have much to say I just kind of sat there and listened and they kept on saying you know the glory of God the glory of God the glory of God this the glory of God that God does everything for his own glory for his own glory over and over it was the theme of the day it seemed like they were obsessed with that idea and I was I couldn't get that at first but then it started to click at a moment because I always had a bit of a dissonance. There was on this hand, this idea, okay, the gospel matters, repentance matters, um, believing in Jesus matters. And I've always been told that my whole life. And I've prayed that prayer many times whenever I was a kid and I was scared that I might go to hell or whatever. Mm -hmm. That always mattered. And, and, and in recent times, I'd seen from like Paul Washer's sermons, wow, this is such an important and impactful thing. This can change my life. And, but it wasn't until I saw that the glory of God was connected to it and that God actually sent his son, the father sent his son to glorify God right to glorify himself in his own name that's when everything kind of clicked into place where I could understand the cosmic worldwide significance and the life significance of Christianity and the fact that I could give myself wholeheartedly to this like intellectually and personally and in my soul and everything mm -hmm. that's when everything kind of felt like it just settled into place like a joint that was out of socket that popped back in yeah. an injury that was healed or something like that and I just remember thinking wow this this element of the glory of God it just it literally was like a light bulb flicked on and from wow. that day on that aspect has never been a question for me that's made total sense and the beautiful thing is I later go and I, I'm reading in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6 which is one of my favorite verses which is what part of what John Piper preached on this very evening, which was so encouraging. Um, and this exact experience, this, this exact, all these elements of this verse and this exact experience I remember taking place for me in the back seat of that car. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So when it says, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of the darkness, mm -hmm. that means it's the God who created all things. Yeah. So there's cosmic significance. Yeah. Yeah. The God who created all things has shone in our hearts, your heart, Vandy, mm -hmm. my heart, mm -hmm. each individual Christian elect person's heart. Mm -hmm. And what is it all about? To give the light of the knowledge of God. So everything intellectually as also spiritually in your heart, your whole person clicks into place, right? And then to finish with, it says, the light of the knowledge of what? Of the glory of God where? In the face of Jesus Christ. This is when Paul Washer is talking about Jesus died. All of it clicks together, right? In the face of Jesus Christ. And so that moment was just a game changer for me. I wish I could tell you that my entire life cleaned up and my act got together instantly. That's not the case. And so I'd encourage anyone who still struggled with sin or some, something like that in their early days, just keep on pressing on, keep on going on. Yeah. Not sounding, I make it sound like I don't still struggle with sin, but you know yeah. what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some major, major things in your life that need to get cleaned up and getting rid of before yeah. you can yeah. really um, start to feel like you're on sort of steady ground and yeah. you're not constantly yeah. being knocked down and yeah. shaken about. Yeah, tossed um, to and fro. Tossed to and fro, yeah, with doctrine or with yeah. disobedience, whatever it might be. You got s assurance yeah. of salvation there. Yeah, the, yeah. the well, that, I would say I wrestled with assurance for quite a long time after that, actually. I, okay. This is where clarity in terms of this is true, yeah, right? Yeah. Whether yeah. there's a big difference between believing something is true right. and believing that the good things about it being true applies to you. Right. You see what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. this is where the moment came when I understand, okay, well, the Bible is true. Mm. The word is true. Uh, God created the world. Everything is making sense. The gospel is true. This is what's worth living for. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. Now, whether or not Jesus and God and all of that's valid for you and, the, and that Jesus loves you mm -hmm. personally mm -hmm. is a little bit more difficult to always ascertain, especially when you're not perfectly obeying his word, right? Sure, sure, sure. So you're not seeing the fruit per do, se. Do so. you want to say something about assurance of salvation? Mm -hmm. you, uh, you know, I had an interview with a reform pastor in Cape Town recently mm -hmm. also, a, a a, a dynamic uh, expository mm. preacher uh, yeah. believes in the doctrines of grace but mm. he also went through a process of struggling to get assurance mm. of salvation do you want to say something about mm. that how the process worked for you yes um, yeah it's something that's that's where you 
start off and you, you have a rudimentary beginning faith in Christ. And I believe that what's interesting is that very first moment you cast yourself fully on Christ when you believe in his propitiating work on your behalf, the substitution that he, his blood has, has done for your sin. I believe there's a moment there where you definitely feel real, true assurance. You feel a settled assurance. But then everyone knows your spiritual state is, is up and down yeah. and in flux and stuff like that. So there's, you know, there's like a, a moment. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't mean everything you do after that is a wise action, right? Sure. You just begin to understand how to move into the direction of wisdom. And so then I think that the path that I'm on uh, was on after that and the path that that took place is very biblical and normal, right? Because the moment you get converted, then it's it's work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Yeah. Make your calling and election sure. For Examine yourself to see if yeah. you're in the faith, right? All of these concepts, which is that it's a progressive thing and that your assurance actually grows. Mm -hmm. And the other day I was, I was preaching on uh, assurance and I listened to Joel Beakey as part of my sermon preparation because he... I just found out today he grew up in a denomination that where almost no one was allowed to have assurance of salvation. Really? Yes, which is what inspired him to go and study what for his doctorate? Assurance, right? Yeah. And he, um, in his sermon that I was listening to in preparation, he goes and he says, you know what's interesting is every Christian is not, it, you can get to a point of being assured, but he said every Christian should be constantly striving to gain more and more settledness, more and more assurance, constantly gaining and growing in it. So it's not like this stagnant thing. You can always you can always have more of God, more of his peace, more of his fullness. You know, you never in this life, we're never fully there. Right. In that regard. Yes. yes. And so that's one way to look at assurance is it's a battle in the beginning to get to a point where you're not constantly getting knocked off. You're yeah. off the horse and not constantly right. feeling inadequate like you haven't. Um, please the Lord and that he's looking with a frown. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, then, and then it's that cycle of, well, you mess up and now you got to go beat yourself on the back and feel shame for yeah. however long, you know, that kind of bad cycle. And yeah. I feel like that's just something that I grew over in time. And, you know, yes. it's, it's, I think that that's an encouraging thing for some really sincere Christians to know that it's okay for a Christian to have struggle with assurance sometimes. Sure, right? sure, sure. We have to reckon with the fact that Satan is a powerful foe. And actually, all first nine reasons I gave you, Satan wants to use all of them to keep you from assurance. He wants to flood your mind with doubt and fear. He wants to taunt you with how sinful you still are and to persuade you that you therefore cannot be a child of God. But Satan is a defeated foe, and you need to remember that. And you need to take all ten of these things and be aware of them and say, I will not let any of these, by the grace of God, destroy my assurance. Dirk, so then uh, you got a call for ministry and mm. you ended up at RTS mm. yes. and you eventually finished uh, MDiv a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I would like to now take us to the Institute for Reformation in South Africa. Mm. Um, uh, I've got it here on my, on my smartphone. Um, on the, the 22nd of April, mm -hmm. 2022, you sent me a message on Messenger. Mm -hmm. And I think you said you used Google Translate to make sure your Afrikaans was uh, well yeah, executed. Here and there, yeah, I need, help. <laughs> I need a little help where I can get it. <laughs> okay, so, so you, you're at RTS and mm -hmm. you've got an elective module on Hermann Barfink. Mm -hmm. Well, no, not quite. Okay. Um, explain, explain to us the yeah, whole let me, let me just yes. let, let me back it up a little bit. Uh, <laughs> after we finished at, at, at the one college, I was there for two years, and then I moved out west okay. to uh, Trinity Western University. And uh, there my experience was that I continued to play hockey and got to see the doctrines of grace like really impact a lot of my teammates as well and, and right. bless their lives too, just in believing it and speaking about it and, and explaining it from scripture and seeing a lot of guys benefit from from that uh, impact on their life. I also met my wife Elise at Trinity too. Uh, so that was a huge thing. And the, the Lord very clearly led me to go there to kind of a last minute change of plan. So it's always, he's always guiding our steps and, and he's so sovereign and good to us in that regard. We don't have to worry about anything. 
Um, just to say, you've been married, and your firstborn yeah. is was born about six six weeks yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, she, yeah, Liana or Liana in Afrikaans, Lena in English. Yeah, she's she's beautiful. We'll and, say uh, Liana. Yeah, maybe for now you say Liana, right? Because we're going to South Africa. But yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's truly uh, it's truly a privilege to be a father. Beautiful. It's a bit of a long journey to get there, so very grateful for that. Praise um, the Lord. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and Annalise is a great mother, and it's all it's all wonderful. So, and she studied um, some theology as well. Yes. So, here, let me. So, let me take us now. Went there. We met, and then after that, um, I was coaching hockey for one year, and then COVID came, and everything got kind of scrambled. Yeah. I'd already started doing my Masters of Divinity online up in Canada. Right. And at that point, we. Elise and I decided, okay, well, all the sports are canceled. Everything is, uh, the world is going crazy. We're going to move to Mississippi. <laughs> so three weeks after we got married, we moved to Mississippi together. And Elise, uh, she took a degree in Christian counseling. Okay. And I did a Master's of Divinity. And, um, yeah, we really, yeah, we really had a, an interesting experience, right? Because we just married then moving 38 hours away from home to a different place, a yeah. different country, the deep south, a whole different um, oh, yeah. experience. Compared so, to yeah. Canada as well. Yeah, a, culture, a culture cult shock yeah, as well. Yeah, where it's kind of normal to be a Christian versus up in Canada, it's mm -hmm. definitely an oddity to be a faithful Christian. So yeah. um, kind of a big culture shock and a change of pace. And then okay. to get to like the Bofink and Bofink and Kiet type stuff. Um, the yes, yes, the, yes, the book from Kiet. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you wrote a chapter in this book. Yes, sir, we'll, we'll yeah. get to that now. But let's yeah. first let's first go. So then you you watch one or two of our videos or something. Yeah. So uh, yeah, what the way that we connected for this message was, um, I was sitting there in the in the the lab there with some other students, and I was thinking, man, these guys are all talking about I want to go to study so and so seventeen hundred French theologian or. Where's this German guy that no one's done enough research on or blah, blah, blah. Or Puritans. Or yeah, and I kind of got like, well, what? I mean, I remember going to South Africa a few years ago and seeing that the money had Soli Deo Gloria on it. Like, certainly there's got to be at least a few. That was the, I think the one rand coin yeah. had, had that yeah. for a long time. Yes. Yeah, I think they maybe just took it off like in the last year or two, right? Yeah, and, that's right. And I just remember thinking, man, if that's on the money and that's, that's one of the five solas, like, I mean, Certainly, there must be at least one good theologian over there. <laughs> so, reformed, I, reformed so then I started theologian. Googling and researching, and I find out, oh, here's Ferdi, and he's already doing this. And so then I emailed you and asked you, uh, I don't know what the gist of the message was, but basically, is it worth it? Like, is there anybody yeah, yeah. worth studying as far as yeah. like, making a good, valuable contribution sure, to sure. W the world or South yes. Africa or theology yeah. and things like From that? From the 1900s, yeah. you said? Yeah, and then well, you named a few names like Johan Haynes, who studied under Birkauer, yeah. after Barfink and That's so just forth. That's some names I picked up on my rough kind of research, my Google searchings. So yeah, then there I, you go. It was a blessing to be able to find somebody because <laughs> that was the, that was the struggle. Like I feel like yeah. you can find, you can look up those names, but there's so much criticism and critique. It's hard to keep sure. everything straight. So then finally, I found you, and I was like, oh, it's conservative, evangelical. Smiles a lot. <laughs> Sounds like a good guy to contact. So. Um, but let's yeah. just before we go there, just add one or two little yeah. extra bits. I mean, we've we've yeah. had how many chats have we had over the past two years? I yeah. mean, it must be dozens. Of most yeah. of them will be at least one hour. Yeah, and it would be you in like Canada. Each other for I'm in Cape longer. Town, and usually it's after twelve o'clock at night. So I'll go outside, go stand at the garage, so that the family can sleep, <laughs> and uh, we'll have some <laughs> some interesting thing about barfing uh, or, or something. Yeah. Um, but but let me just add something else mm -hmm. about what you, I remember you told me. You told me you've been to South Africa with your family a couple of times, mm -hmm. and there was something that you also experienced. Mm -hmm. When yes. you are there with the people, uh, just mm. say something about that. Yeah, so whenever I was in Canada, it's almost like there was a, like I, I would consider myself, you know, a Canadian and proud to be one, you know. I, I mean, I've always, whenever the Olympics come along, I'm ready to cheer on Canada and ice hockey, and I was as excited as any other guy. But mm. since I had such a strong Afrikaans, uh, South African identity in my home, yeah. I always felt a little bit out of place. And there's certain cultural things that are just a little bit different between the Canadians and, and the South Africans. And so 
every time when we'd come home, it would just feel so like, it'd feel so right to be like walking in a grocery store and be able to speak Afrikaans with a stranger or something like that. I always felt like, wow, that's so crazy that that can be a thing. And, and everybody is greeting know. everybody. Goeiemorre, hoe yeah, handig? Yeah, well, um, I mean, um, Canadians, you know, Canadians are known as being very polite and kind and everything too. Uh, so there's not mm. like that was so different, but okay. the, the language thing was huge. And then yeah, just yeah. the the different things that had such a sentimental value, like right. the foods and the uh, cultures and the art and whatever other stuff Wonderful. that was relevant. So you felt at home when you came here. Yeah, yeah, to a felt, large extent. yeah. And your parents put lots of effort in mm -hmm. making sure that you know the history of South Africa, yeah, Afrikaans correct, yeah. and yeah. all those things. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. your, your Afrikaans is remarkable. I couldn't believe it when we started mm -hmm. to chat and you went to Canada as a baby, mm -hmm. and your Afrikaans is on such a level that you sound uh, well, Afrikaans. It might sound Afrikaans. good, but I'm missing about 30% of the words I need <laughs> <laughs> to be able to have a good interview in Afrikaans. Right. But yeah. Okay, so, they, so I'm very thankful that they right. had a rule where they only spoke Afrikaans at home. So okay. I don't know a single day of my life that I didn't know Afrikaans. Okay, English, so yeah. did your mom or dad ever help you with maths? With maths? Yes. Uh, yeah, my dad, my mom maybe at a certain grade was like, this I'm going to hand off to my dad, but yeah. So how did they translate uh, algebra trigonometry? Did they do that in Afrikaans or in English? No, I'm asking because we've been in England so many years and I, I gave up at some point, you yeah. know, the girls, you know, you have to do it in, in English. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that the nice thing about math is it's mostly a numbers thing, which is pretty much the same, but no matter what language you're in. But yeah, the I think my dad probably just would do English or something like that. Or okay. Maybe okay. I'll try to listen in class and not need help or something. But <laughs> yeah. No, I well done. I mean, I, I mean, yeah. I take my hat off for Afrikaans mm -hmm. families overseas. Uh, I mean, we've got a couple of other friends here as well mm -hmm. at the conference, Afrikaans people, and all their kids can speak really good Afrikaans. Yeah, it's a real you know, privilege to wonderful. be able to speak Afrikaans. Yeah. Great. Very thankful for wonderful. that. Wonderful. Okay, mm -hmm. so can I quickly change gears and just sure. before we're going to go into Barvink and how this happened and, and so on, just say something. So we came back to South Africa after 15 years, mm -hmm. uh, um, July last year, uh, 2023. A call for ministry coming back, well, not normal ministry, but establishing an institute in mm -hmm. Stellenbosch. Uh, we really sense that the reformed history, uh, the legacy has been tainted or mm -hmm. annexed by the liberals in South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and we would watch documentaries in England and North America about South Africa. And all they have to say about everything before 1994 was, you know, racism and apartheid and all those things. And nothing about the heroes of faith. Uh, mm -hmm. And I remember before we came from England, I did research at Tyndale House, um, uh, where you see the English uh, does such, such a great job preserving mm -hmm. their reformers. Uh, yes. Wycliffe, uh, Cranmer, uh, I was at uh, Ridley, uh, I had friends at Ridley in Cambridge. I was at uh, Cranmer Hall in, at Durham. Mm -hmm. Uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, Wilberforce Institutes, how they have uh, publishing houses, yeah. how they've got documentaries and all those stuff. And I just sensed, where are the heroes of faith uh, in the reform tradition in Southern Africa? And there was mm. nothing. So part of our call has been to come and try to mm. find that. And uh, when yeah. we came for that ministry, we started with Barthink, mm -hmm. and then we discovered Kiet. Mm -hmm. He's a student uh, yes. who studied uh, with him, mm -hmm. and uh, we were amazed at the things we discovered that mm -hmm. basically nobody in the outside world knows about. Mm -hmm. Take us from there. We start to chat. I tell you about Kiet. I, uh, I sent some material, mm -hmm. an English chapter that he wrote, uh, The Ethics of mm -hmm. Apartheid, for instance. You start reading that, and tell us what, start, what is starting to happen in your mind and your heart as you start doing research yeah. on all of that. Yeah, I mean, uh, Boffing kind of was immediately a part of my seminary education. Um, and the first, I think it was almost the first week I was there, I talked to the registrar and she uh, she asked me something along the lines of, are you a Boffing guy? And I literally had never heard his name before. And I responded like kind of a smart, stupid response and I was like, I don't know so much about these Boffing guys. Like, I'd rather be like a Jesus guy or something like that, <laughs> which is kind of a snarky thing to say. Uh, 
But um, turns out, you know, I do I do have a great appreciation for reading Boffing and, and the stuff that he had to say. I didn't end up taking the module that she recommended. She The reason she asked if I was a Boffing guy was so that I could take a module and uh, ended up not taking it. But a lot of his literature was involved in our degree. So you'd end up seeing, wow, this man does have a lot of really wonderful insights into the faith, into um, the way that uh, Christianity interacts with the world, lots of different um, lots of different insights that just kind of mind-blowing things. And so then finally I got in touch with you. And in our conversation, we started talking about Bibi Kiet. And I started getting, wow, this is so amazing. There's actually a person out there trying to recover these, these good theologians and these people who uh, stood for Sola Scriptura. And um, then we get to Kiet. And it's an amazing man, you know, Bibi Kiet, to think that there is a guy who is a South African, Afrikaans guy, who literally spent time in the USA at the most famous, one of the Princeton. most famous times of in history yeah, at Old Princeton. Yeah. At the same, and um, I don't think he took a degree there or anything like that, but he, he certainly would have rubbed shoulders with the likes of B.B. Warfield, the other B.B., right? B.B. Kiet and B.B. Warfield were buddies, mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, J. Gresham Machen. Uh, he came later. Machen came just after... He was there at the same time. Was he there at the same time? So, yeah. I'm, like almost certain, okay. I'm almost certain that at the beginning, at the very beginning of Machen's time, yeah. he was there. And then also Voss. So all of those guys... Uh, yeah. And Voss was friends with, with, with Barfink. Voss. Yes, yes. And so that might have been, I don't know if that was part of their connection. But then later on, um, Kiet goes to Amsterdam and studies with... Was in Amsterdam, oh, yes, yeah, and, he, and he studied university. with Boffing at yeah. the Free University. So okay. at that time, I was like, wow, this is such an interesting person. Yeah. And then not only that, but then once you sent me the stuff about ethics of apartheid and, and some of his other uh, pieces that, that uh, Kiet had written, and just I started researching and reading about what some other people have written about him and the connection between him and Boffing. I was like just fascinated about it, and hmm. it was just a privilege to be able to do a little bit of a little piece here to kind of make put a connection between Boffing and Kiet and, and uh, that was not yeah, a, to think that he... It was not a little piece, by was the, the way. Bigger piece. It, it, it was a substantial piece. A long -winded and piece. Uh, we are still finishing <laughs> the translation. So it's from Cape yeah. Town to Canada. Yeah, sure. From Herman Boffing to Bebe Kiet, a theological journey with Dirk de Waal. Yeah. So from Cape Town as a baby to Canada, mm -hmm. and in Canada you discover Barving and Bierbierkiet, and now you're coming back. It's it's, yeah. a, it's a remarkable journey. Yeah, down in the, down, yeah down in the states, just learning about yeah. It's a very it's a very amazing journey, and uh, yeah, it's a privilege to be able to know that there's people like him that you know stood strong in a biblical sola scriptura way. It's yeah. really the only reason I wanted to do it. I mean, really, is because I I want to be like a guy like that, you know, yeah. I want to be like that kind of people, like Boffink and Kietu, yeah. who, um, you know, on the one hand, were uh, willing to listen, so they embody that Christian spirit of being willing to listen to divergent views and ideas, but always maintaining orthodoxy and always maintaining a very yet firm and dogmatic stance on what's true, yeah. while also taking into consideration those other matters. Um, right. And in that regard, just amazingly, but then also the way that they um, were not afraid to take risks, to go against the tide. Yes. They're really, I mean, exemplary people. Yeah. Uh, and, and, yeah. and they show a lot of virtue and character. So sure. once I started reading about it, it's like, man, these guys are awesome. Great. Really cool. So, uh, Can I just yeah. say one of th two extra things there? So, so you also then discovered how uh, in the mainline churches, that Reformed Church in South Africa, how mm -hmm. uh, the church's endorsement of, of apartheid, uh, how that narrative uh, is being used today by the progressives to mm -hmm. say that was uh, um, a time when we subscribe to the you know, authority of scripture, mm. and we uh, endorsed apartheid, mm -hmm. and now we have to change our uh, understanding of scripture and the methodologies we use, and now we have to, it's mm -hmm. like dominoes, now we have to have uh, the woman ordination, mm -hmm. we have to have gay marriage. Uh, sure, yeah. The Dutch Reformed Church is now talking about interfaith uh, mm. church services uh, last, last a couple of months ago. Um, so, so tell us how Kiet helps us to break that 
narrative and that domino effect that is quite powerful in the in the Dutch Reformed Church. Yeah, I, I think that the most valuable contribution that he makes is in the fact that he, as a man in an authority position, in a position of a lot of pressure, did not succumb to any political force or something that was outside of the church and outside of the Christian sphere in order and in order to succumb to that pressure and then change his views accordingly right and that's such an easy it's a common temptation for all Christians at all yeah. times right yeah. um, but especially in that moment just to be able to go back and recover someone who no was willing to stand almost man alone right at times against tremendous personal pressure for what he believed was right and what he believed was in line with the scriptures um, you know it reminds you of a person of virtue like Martin Luther or John Calvin and these men who you know even when everyone says it, it's like uh, I think Jonathan Edwards has something along the lines I will to live for God or for resolution one I will to live for God resolution two if no one else will I still will yeah <laughs> So like kind of yeah. like that kind of mentality was yeah. on display. And so I to find that, a man exactly. like this, then you can hold up and say, there's, a, there's an example here amidst a difficult time. Not, not in the sense that we want to completely discredit every single other person or every th other theologian yeah. at that time. It's just that he definitely stands out as this amazing model sure. of faithfulness in that time. So, right. yeah, yeah, I think... Yeah, so so we, I don't know if that answered the question. Absolutely, probably. yeah, bit, yeah, yeah. So we are we are excited about every year doing a, a conference where mm. we want to rediscover one of the heroes of the faith. Uh, this was Kiet the first year. We are almost done with the English translation for it. Uh, this year, mm. uh, do you want to just uh, sort of uh, give us a little teaser for this year's? for this year's thing? What, what are we What are we working on? Don't give too much away, but just a little taste. Yeah, I don't. I, I think you need to give that teaser. You could, <laughs> you're going to be a much better teaser. Say no, something. No. You don't want to no, say something. No, I'm not ready to say anything about that because I don't even know if I'll be able to contribute or work on it too much yet. I'm trying to move, and I'm trying to do an international move. You and, uh, and you've just had a baby, yeah. but you've already made a contribution. The conversations we've had, yes, you, you sure. read, you read that significant oh, yes, paper. Yes. Okay, yeah, the paper and, was, and very we've had a chat about yeah. that. So, so, so just a brief little appetizer. So, we, while we were doing research for the Kiet book, um, we, um, one of our assistants, uh, Yvette Dreyer, who's helping us at the archives in Stellenbosch, she was reading sermons from the 19th century mm -hmm. when we were doing research on Kiet and then she discovered a, a, a pastor, Franz Cachet, who came from Holland, uh, who preached beautiful sermons mm -hmm. that was published and he wasn't ordained immediately because uh, he still had to finish his languages. The Dutch Reformed Church brought, brought in a, a, a colloquium doctum where you have to have an examination. So in the meantime, he did some missionary work in Cape Town mm -hmm. and he did a missionary work with a causa reformed Presbyterian. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to give his name away yet. But anyway, that uh, reformed causa yeah. brother went in the 1850s to Scotland to study at a reformed Presbyterian seminary uh, and at Edinburgh University, mm -hmm. uh, came back eventually and in 1866 gave her a very significant lecture in Cape Town at the YMCA mm -hmm. defending Calvinism, the authority of scripture, mm -hmm. rejecting the survival of the fittest that we got mm -hmm. from Darwin um, and his followers, mm -hmm. uh, and challenging the Europeans mm -hmm. not to compromise but yeah. to follow the gospel. So uh, he also translated uh, um, uh, John Bunyan into Corsa. Mm -hmm. So we are so excited uh, about yeah. the prospect of having our second volume yes. on uh, the first reformed uh, Corsa brother that mm. studied in Europe came back. Uh, the second uh, Lechbaken, right? In, in English, how would you we'll say that would be a lighthouse. lighthouse, lighthouse of our reformed yeah. history uh, in Southern Africa. Yeah. So, so, Dirk, thank you mm. so much for mm. the conversation and uh, um, we pray that the Lord will open all the doors yes. necessary for you to come. Mm. Um, can, can I ask you mm. uh, to do a prayer yes. for South Africans who have lost hope, 
who are overwhelmed by the progressives and mm -hmm. the mainline churches and synods who are moving away from scripture mm -hmm. and could benefit from the ministry that you feel God has called you sure. in South Africa. Father, God, we thank you, Father, for who you are, and we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your word and for your truth. I do thank you that you've chosen to speak, Lord, and that, that because you've chosen to speak and speak with authority that we have the ability to know you. And because your spirit is alive and active in the world and because you're calling your people to yourself, we have the ability to know you, to be in relationship to, with you, to even have you dwell in us and with us. And it's a tremendous privilege, Lord, to, to have this as a reality, God. And we thank you, Father, for sending your Son, your Son to pay for our sin, to set us in a right standing before you, to give us grace that we need, to help us in times of need. And Father, I pray that you would help uh, all of those who around the world and in South Africa who are finding these to be very tumultuous times, times where their spiritual, social lives feel like they're in upheaval too, just in every respect because of the, ta the speed at which things are changing and the mm -hmm. ways in which things are changing and yeah. the kinds of lies that are active and impacting the church, Lord. I just pray then that you would give much grace in time of need to those who are your people who truly want to and sincerely want to stay on your path, but who have to fight against this stream, this forceful stream that's uh, seeking to pull them asunder and to pull them off their track, Lord. And God, I just thank you for South Africa. I thank you for the ministry of Ursa. I thank you for the opportunity to strive to defend the true gospel and the truth about how you've created mankind, how you've created your world, Lord, how you've created us each different, but also from the same root in Adam, Lord, how you've created us as a beautiful family and that every nation, tribe and tongue will be there praising you and serving you in the end, Lord. I, I do thank you for all of these wonderful ways that you've been at work in South Africa and around the world at this time. I pray that you'd strengthen your church. I pray especially that you would build many strong local bodies of believers in South Africa where the word and the gospel comes first and all the other things come second. Yes. And uh, I pray also for strength to those who are faithful and revival by your spirit, Lord a word-based true revival on the gospel, on returning and repenting and being broken over sin because of who you truly are as our holy God and one that is worthy of praise and worthy of honor because you are triune and you are beautiful and you are perfect. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.